All right. Uh, hello, everyone. As Elena said, my name is Maggie Tobin. I'm a content creation intern with the Soundtech research team at Dolby, currently based in Brooklyn. Um, as she said, my work at Dolby has mostly been focused on developing best practices for mixing music in Atmos, um, specifically for mixing on headphones. Um, so that's going to be kind of the foundation for this tutorial on how to get started mixing in Atmos at home. So just to give you an idea of what I'm gonna uh, talk about today, I'll start with a little crash course on some spatial audio concepts behind Dolby Atmos, um, particularly when it comes to how Atmos renders audio for headphones. Um, next, we'll go over how to set up the Dolby Atmos production suite for mixing at home and uh, talk a little bit about signal flow and how audio is actually traveling from your DAW to the Atmos renderer. Um, and I saw a lot of Pro Tools users in the chat, which is awesome because I use Pro Tools. So I'll have a lot of useful knowledge for you then. Um, and then we'll do a little Q&A after that portion, see if anybody has any questions up until that point. Um, and then last, I'll get a little philosophical. Um, and talk about how to work toward changing your mindset when mixing in Atmos compared to mixing in stereo. Um, and then we'll jump over to Pro Tools and I'll take you through one of my Atmos mixing sessions. Um, so overall, I'm hoping that by the end of this tutorial, you'll leave with a better understanding of what's actually happening to your audio when you mix in Atmos and feel a little better prepared to jump in and start mixing yourself, um, especially at this time when so many of us are working from home away from studios and big loudspeaker setups. All right. Um, so just a little background. Uh, Dolby Atmos Music is an immersive experience that gives you the freedom to add more space, clarity, and depth to your music. So where in stereo, your music might sound like it's happening in your head or on a single horizontal plane from left to right, um, Atmos Music happens all around you. On top of that, uh, Dolby Atmos mixes can be rendered for any playback system. So whether that's a home theater system, a smart speaker, or a pair of headphones. Uh, so from a mixing perspective, this means that you could potentially mix an immersive track almost entirely on headphones um, and then take it into the studio, listen on speakers, and find that it translates pretty well already. Uh, so how does this actually work? Um, so when we think of immersive or 3D sound, we might typically think of it in the context of channel-based audio, um, which you might associate with cinema sound because we've all probably been to a movie theater and seen how those are set up with speakers all around the audience. Um, although that being said, formats like 5.1 have definitely made their mark in the music industry as well. Um, so this slide shows what a multi-channel system like that might look like with left, right, and center channels, um, and then some surrounds. Um, when you mix channel-based audio, you create your immersive image by balancing the sound between a predetermined number of channels. Uh, the downside being, of course, that a mix like this can only be reproduced by the same number of channels on which you mixed it. Um, and this can be limiting, especially now that people listen on so many different types of devices. So in contrast, Dolby Atmos makes use of what's known as object-based audio. Um, and this means that rather than manually spreading a sound between speakers to create the impression of a single sound source, you as the mixer uh, can think of every track in your mix as a sound object um, that you can place anywhere in the space around you. Uh, and as this slide shows, each object's, each object's position is encoded as an XYZ coordinate, um, all of which are then decoded and rendered during playback, uh, regardless of the number of audio channels you're listening on. So to make this process as intuitive as possible for Atmos mixers, we have the Dolby Atmos production suite. Uh, so what you're seeing on this slide is the Atmos renderer tool, which is part of the production suite. And this takes audio tracks routed from your DAW and allows you to pan those tracks as sound objects, uh, seen here as bright green spheres. Um, and it also encodes that audio and panning information into one master file called Adobe Atmos master file. Um, and hopefully you can see this slide well enough to see that there's a sort of human avatar at the center of the virtual space those sound objects are in. Um, this avatar is the stand-in for the listener's perspective in the mix. Um, so you can see that objects can be placed anywhere around them, um, in front, behind, above, on the sort of quote unquote wall of this virtual room, or maybe even in the middle of the room. Um, just a heads up, if I ever start talking about a wall, I refer to something as being on the wall, this is the wall I'm referring to. So um, you can pan your sound objects using a plugin in your DAW called the Dolby Atmos Music Panner, uh, which is free to download. Um, and you can see it open in the, in the image on the left here. 
um, and see how it depicts also a sort of virtual room like the one in the render window on the right. Um, so with this panner, you can control the position, elevation, and size of an object and send all of that metadata right over to the renderer. Um, you can see in this animation how the panner plugin on the left is controlling the movement of the objects in the renderer window on the right. Um, now, placing sound objects all around you seems like it might be more or less an intuitive process if you're mixing on a huge loudspeaker uh, system and you have those visual cues of loudspeakers. But we live in a time where headphones and earbuds are, for many of us, and certainly for me, um, the main way we listen to music. So how can we create and listen to immersive mixes using only headphones? Uh, the answer is binaural rendering. So for those who might be unfamiliar, uh, binaural audio is two-channel audio that recreates for headphones the sort of natural everyday experience that we have of sound being externalized and happening all around us. So in Atmos, this means that you can still experience the effect of having all of those green spheres or sound objects around you, um, even if you only have access to a pair of headphones. So just to give you an idea of what this sounds like, I'm going to end this slideshow for a second and play some audio samples. So once again, I'm going to play that pink noise demo that I played at the beginning. This is just normal stereo. So you should hear a burst in your left ear and your right ear. All right, and now I'm going to play a binauralized version of that same thing. So hopefully over this stream, the impression you got was that there was still pink noise in your left ear, still pink noise in your right ear, but it should have sounded a little further away from your head, a little more externalized. Uh, so here's another example using a more musical um, example. Uh, so this is a guitar. Again, you're going to hear it in your left ear and your right ear. This is just normal stereo. All right. And then this is a binauralized version of that. So again, you should hear things kind of more externalized outside your head. Um, and this guitar is going to be panned to a couple different positions other than just left and right as well. to my slides. So um, now that we know what that sounds like, um, I'll give you a little background on how it works. Um, the Atmos binaural experience relies on two components, the first being head-related transfer functions, um, which you might have also heard called HRTFs. So using an HRTF is like putting the sounds in your mix through a filter or EQ, um, except this specific filter factors in three different pieces of information. Um, so the first is the difference in time between when a sound source hits your closest ear and far ear. The second cue is the difference in level at which the sound reaches your two ears. Um, and this level difference happens because as the diagram in the middle shows, the ear farthest from the sound source is blocked slightly by our head. Um, and lastly, HRTFs also factor in the spectral alterations to the sound that may happen as a result of flexion, reflections off your head, torso, shoulders, and even the ridges on the outside of your ear. So when all of these cues are combined and imposed on a sound, they lead you to perceive that sound as originating from a point source outside of your head. So with this kind of processing, a mixer can get a good idea of where sounds might be placed if they were mixing on loudspeakers just by monitoring on headphones. So the second aspect of the uh, Atmos binaural experience is the simulated room response. Um, and this is essentially a subtle room reverb that helps emulate the room acoustics that you might experience if you are mixing in a sort of acoustically treated studio. Uh, so if you're primarily mixing on headphones, this feature is there to help you create something that will translate well to loudspeakers down the line. Um, but it's very subtle, very natural, so it won't clash with any artistic reverbs you'd like to use in your mix. Um, also, as a feature that's unique to the Atmos headphone experience, uh, you can control how much of this room reverb you'd like to use on each object and basically control each object's uh, perceived distance from the listener. 
So this way you can help the sound seem even more externalized and, uh, or you might just wanna add contrast and depth to your mix. Um, but don't worry, we'll go a lot deeper into that a little later. And I apologize, there's a bus making a lot of noise outside my apartment right now. So I hope that's not coming through too loud. Um, so now that we have a little background on what kind of processing is going on under the hood, uh, let's talk signal flow and how to go about setting up your DAW to mix in Dolby Atmos. So one thing that I noticed when I started mixing in Atmos was that once I took the time to really figure out how my DAW and the renderer were connected, um, things got a whole lot easier. <laughs> um, so making sure up front that these two pieces of software are sort of speaking the same language um, can help with so many things from making better logistical decisions when you're organizing your session um, to avoiding any errors when you're all done mixing and you're creating your master file. Uh, there are some very informative videos on the Dolby Professional site uh, that cover aspects of this too. And um, hopefully that link should be in the chat soon. And um, I'll also uh, post a link to it at the end as well. Uh, but I figured I would take this time to go through setting up a session um, from beginning to end and give all of you a chance to ask any questions um, that you might have in person. So to mix an Atmos, there are really only three basic things you need. Uh, the first is an Atmos compatible DAW. So that would be either Pro Tools Ultimate, Logic Pro, or Ableton Live, um, either the standard or suite versions. Um, you also need the Dolby Atmos production suite, which includes the Atmos renderer. And lastly, you need something to monitor on. Um, Atmos can, of course, be used with several different speaker setups, but um, as we've just talked about, you can absolutely monitor on headphones. So that's what we'll be focusing on today. So just to break this general signal flow down a little bit more, um, each track in your DAW gets sent over to the renderer as a sound object. Um, this includes the audio, but also the panning metadata, which tells the renderer where each object is positioned in the mix. Uh, you also have the option to send audio to a pre-configured 712 uh, channel-based bed in the renderer. And the way that I kind of look at it, um, I see this bed as being there to offer a sort of bridge to object-based audio uh, for anyone who might be more familiar with channel-based formats. So personally, I use mostly objects in my mixes, but I do use this bed for immersive reverbs and delays, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit more later, um, because it's very easy to route those effects right into the bed. So all of this information can be sent to the renderer using a virtual interface called the Dolby Audio Bridge. Uh, which has 130 inputs and outputs, and it comes free with the download of the Atmos production suite. So uh, once all of the object audio and panning information reaches the renderer, you can set the output of the renderer to whatever you use for monitoring, uh, which for today's tutorial is going to be headphones, obviously. And lastly, once your mix is all done, the renderer lets you output several kinds of files and deliverables from it. So this includes your Dolby Atmos master file, which again has all of the object audio and panning information encoded in it. Um, and this can serve as a sort of source file for um, any other deliverables you need to make for your mix, like channel-based speaker renders. Um, for example, if you know your mix is gonna be played back on a 5.1 or 7.1.4 setup in advance, you can make those renders ahead of time. Um, you can also make something called an ADM B-Wave file from your master file. And this is what you would upload to streaming services if you wanted to release your Atmos mix. All right, so now that we have the basic framework for how this all works, let's set up a session. So I'm gonna head over to Pro Tools. Um, so you wanna start with both your renderer window and your DAW open. So as I said, I work in Pro Tools, so that's what I'm gonna use for today's demo, but in case there's any Logic or Ableton users, this basic signal flow remains the same for those DAWs as well. Uh, so first of all, when you create a new session, uh, it's important to make sure that your settings are compatible with the renderer, um, which can support 24-bit audio or um, a sample rate of either 48 or 96 kilohertz um, and several different frame rates. So again, a lot of these specs are outlined at that Dolby Professional site, um, uh, which again, the link should be in the chat. Um, so that's a great resource to bookmark. Um, if you're working in Pro Tools, you should go ahead and set your playback engine to that virtual interface, the Dolby Audio Bridge. Um, and if you were working in Ableton or Logic, this would be your output. All right, and then to make sure that Pro Tools is connected to the renderer, we'll go to Setup, 
peripherals and over to this Dolby Atmos tab. Um, you're going to want to check this enable box here and then the light next to connection status should turn green showing that we are connected. And lastly, we'll go to the Pro Tools IO window. <clears throat> Um, and I'm not, unfortunately, as familiar with the IO setup for Logic in Ableton, so this information is definitely going to be a little Pro Tools specific. Um, so when you download the production suite, um, it should come with an Atmos Pro Tools template that includes um, .pio files or IO presets for using the Dolby Audio Bridge. So let's go ahead and import the stereo version of that in the IO tab. So that would be Dolby Atmos Renderer, Dolby Audio Bridge, stereo.pio. So just to break down this preset a little bit, um, this includes one 712 output, um, which routes straight to our 712 bed in the renderer, and then 59 stereo outputs, which are routed to the 118 object inputs in the renderer. We also have two mono outputs down here. Um, they're labeled LTC 129 and 130. Um, and you can use those if you want to send time code over to the renderer to sync it up to your DAW. Uh, there's also, um, an IO preset that uses all mono outputs, but I've personally found the stereo version to be more flexible uh, because it allows me to more easily work with both stereo and mono objects in my mix. All right, so now that we have our IO set up, uh, let's start sending audio and panning information over to the render. So basically you can think of all of my tracks here as objects and they can be either mono or stereo. So I'm gonna start with my kick track, which is mono. So I'm gonna send that to one output, object 13. So now that I've routed this, this is gonna send my audio to the renderer, but I also need to send over the panning metadata. So that's where the Dolby Atmos music panner comes in. Um, and you can see, I kind of have that and the la as the last plugin in my signal chain on all these tracks. So, now that we have this up, you can see that I've also routed the panner to object 13 up here. So now both my audio and panning metadata will be sent over to the renderer. Um, and like I kind of mentioned earlier, you can use the panner to move an object left to right and front to back and even up and down as needed. Um, you also have control over the size of the object. So when I use this control, you can see the diameter get bigger there. All right, let's move over to my base, um, which is a stereo object. So I'm gonna route it to two outputs, object 11 and 12. So if I open my panner, again, you'll be able to see that it's also routed to objects 11 and 12. Um, and since this is a stereo object, there's a couple different parameters to work with. So. Um, the left and right objects can mirror each other over the x-axis like they are now, or over the y-axis, or both if you want. And then you also have the option to put them in the exact same position if that's what works for you. All right, um, so Pro Tools Ultimate actually has an Atmos panner integrated directly into the DAW, so that can be a great option for you to use for panning too. Um, I personally prefer the interface of this music panner, um, and it's also the only option for panning um, if you're using Logic or Ableton. Um, and it's also free to download. <laughs> so now that we have our IO set up and our tracks are routed to the Dolby Audio Bridge, let's head over to the render window. All right, so we saw this UI a little bit earlier. Um, we have our virtual space, which is gonna show a visual representation of where all of our objects are panned. Um, on the left, we have these 128 circles, which are representing all of the object inputs that you can send audio to from your DAW. Um, and you can see the first 10 inputs are grouped together by this purple box. Uh, those are the inputs for the pre-configured 712 bed. Again, already set up ahead of time for you. So. Now to configure this for headphone monitoring, I'm going to head over to my preferences menu. Um, I have my input device set as the Dolby Audio Bridge so I can get the audio coming from Pro Tools and my output is set to my audio interface or whatever output you wanna use for your headphones. Um, one of the next options I have 
is to put the renderer in headphone only mode, which I'm going to do um, since we'll only be using headphones for this session. Um, and lastly, on this tab, you want to check that Again, your frame rate and sample rate match whatever's being used in your DAW, uh, just to make sure, again, they're speaking the same language. Um, and now I'm gonna head over to the headphone tab. Um, you can see that my render mode is set to stereo. I'm gonna go ahead and switch that to binaural, which as we talked about earlier, is gonna let me hear a 3D representation of my mix on headphones. And last, I'll click accept to save all of these settings. So now uh, you're all set to be playing audio from your DAW to the renderer. Um, I have some IO workarounds going on today, so I'm able to stream audio out to everyone. So you won't be able to hear this particular audio I'm gonna play now, but um, I'm just gonna press play for a second so that you can kind of see what the visual representation of this mix looks like. All right. Uh, now, when I'm all finished with my mix and I want to record my uh, master file, all I need to do is go to File, New Master File. I'm going to go ahead and label it, choose wherever I want to save it. And um, I'll press Create. And you can see that this shows up in kind of the upper left corner over here. Now, all I have to do is record enable the renderer press play. I would go back to Pro Tools, press play there, wherever I want to start recording the master file. And then the renderer will start writing the file, um, including all of the audio and panning information until I press stop. Uh, so I mentioned earlier that there's a way to use time code to sync up your DAW with the renderer. So you can basically control all the play and stop functions directly from your DAW. And this really does make things a lot more streamlined. So for that information, I would direct you again to that Dolby Professional link um, where there are tutorial videos that will take you through how to set that up. Um, so now, as I mentioned earlier, um, I have my master file. So I'll be able to create any, any deliverables that I might need from this, um, including an ADM B-Wave file, which can be uploaded to streaming services. So if you do want to release your Atmos mix, um, actually last year, Avid Play became the first uh, distribution service to allow independent artists to upload Atmos mixes to um, compatible streaming services like Tidal and Amazon Music. So I would definitely recommend um, checking them out for more information. And that's about it for setup and IO. I hope this wasn't too tedious. Um, I just know that it was helpful to me at first to really dive into signal flow and um, hopefully knowing how things are connected can help kind of demystify this tool a little bit and leave you more time to be creative with your music. All right, so. Um, so heading into this next section, there's going to be some more audio sharing. So again, make sure you have your headphones on and that audio movers link up. So I'm just going to do a couple slides real quick. All right, so uh, before we jump into the Pro Tools demo, um, I just wanted to get a little philosophical and talk about some ideas surrounding immersive mixing that have come out of conversations I've had with other engineers, uh, some recent immersive audio panels I've been to, and also just my own experiences. Um, and these are mostly just some things to consider as you get ready to start an Atmos mix. Um, so the first point is on sound field expansion that is afforded by the Atmos environment. So in stereo, you have just two channels to focus on, but in Atmos, you have 360 degrees of space and elevation around you. Um, and even though surround sound has been around for many years, I generally think that DAPS does make the process of um, placing sounds in these regions uh, behind or above listeners more accessible for more people who are maybe new to the concept of immersive sound. So I remember this larger sound field being the thing that overwhelmed and baffled me the most when I first started using Atmos, because I now needed to pay attention to not only the left-right balance, um, but also front back and up and down. Um, and there's a bit of debate about what's the best way to make use of this space. So this brings me to the second point should I be trying to mimic reality with my Atmos mix and basically return to the original purpose of recorded music essentially, which was to create a record of a live performance? Um, or should I be using these tools to create a completely abstract and unique environment? 
Um, so there's no correct answer to this, uh, but I do think this choice is largely genre dependent. So for example, it's easier for listeners to accept an abstract environment when listening to something like EDM or even a lot of current pop and hip hop, because um, a lot of those sounds are synthesized to begin with. But then when you get into genres like classical and jazz and to a certain extent like rock or folk, um, these might be more likely to be recorded acoustically and spatially from the beginning. So they might be more conducive to a more realistic approach. Um, at risk of limiting creativity, um, I think some consideration also has to be made about what consumers want um, and whether they'll accept music flying around their heads or if they prefer a more traditional experience of hearing the music played out mostly in front of them. Um, and I don't think there's really an answer to that question yet. So lots more exploration to be done there. And then lastly, um, many stereo and channel-based mixing techniques are based so much around the mixer's knowledge that the mix is going to be played back on a certain number of channels. Um, but with the flexible rendering that you now get with Atmos, you don't necessarily need to place a sound somewhere because you know there will be a speaker there. So we might see this lead to artistic shifts as simple as things not being as compressed in Atmos mixes compared to stereo because you just have more space to put things. Um, or we might see even more radical shifts such as mixers giving more attention to the attributes of individual objects uh, rather than focusing on how a mix is glued together as a whole um, and sort of taking a more VR-based approach to mixing. Uh, but overall, I think it's important to remember that stereo mixing techniques have evolved so much since that format first emerged. So it's likely that the way people are approaching mixing in Atmos now is going to evolve a lot over the years. Um, and it's going to be exciting to see what new innovation and creativity comes from that. All right. so. I'm gonna go ahead and switch over to Pro Tools again. All right, so um, I'm gonna go through a session for a track called Hydra, um, which is by a great electronic artist, producer, engineer, um, actually from the Bay Area, who goes by the name AFTA, um, and that's A-P-H-T-A, if anyone wants to check him out on social media. Uh, so he mixed this track in stereo first, so I did have that as a reference. And one thing I noticed about his mix was that he played a lot with sounds seeming to be right next to your ears. Um, so I didn't want to stray too far away from that idea, but that might seem kind of counterintuitive to how Atmos should work. <laughs> um, but he also had chose some interesting reverbs, so I wanted to see if I could find a balance between preserving that feeling of sounds being right next to my head, but also expanding the sound field around those sounds outward um, using immersive reverbs and augmenting the mix in that way. So I think this mix uh, represents a convergence of a lot of the different techniques I've tried out over the past few years. So I thought it'd be a good one to use for this tutorial. Um, and it's also a good example of sticking to the artistic intent of original mix. Um, while still capitalizing on the new things that Atmos can bring to it. Um, I also want to emphasize up front, again, that mixing in Atmos is such a new thing. So what works for me might be totally different from what a bunch of other engineers are doing right now. Um, so hopefully this demo will be able to give you some guidelines to start with, but honestly, you should try out whatever you want and do whatever sounds good for your music. So I'm just gonna go ahead and play like the first minute and a half or so of this mix and then we'll get into the Pro Tools session.
right. Um, so that was a great track to begin with. So I really enjoyed mixing it and it was really fun to work with. Um, so before I start talking about things that are unique to Atmos mixing, I think it's important to recognize that a lot of parts of this process are still very similar or identical to stereo mixing. So for example, your overall goal is still to deliver a well-balanced mix that communicates the artist's vision and serves their, mu their musical arrangement. Um, you still wanna make sure to take breaks and rest your ears because mixing entirely on headphones, um, even with binaural rendering can still be fatiguing. Uh, you also still want to take time to organize your session. Um, so I received about 60 stereo stems from the artist for this track. Um, and the first thing I did was relabel all of them <laughs> and uh, sort them by instrument, color code them, and assign all my outputs. Um, so it looks like I have rhythm, synthesizer, and sound effects groups here. And each one of those is controlled by a VCA fader. Um, I also listen through to every track and take notes um, in the comment section about where I might want to pan things or what delays and reverbs I might want to use. Um, it just helps if everything in the mix is a known quantity before I start making any big decisions. Um, another thing that's similar to stereo mixing, you always want to be paying attention to loudness metering. Um, so let's go back over to the renderer, um, which has a built-in loudness meter here. So you can use this to mix to uh, the target loudness of minus 18 LUFs, which is about which, which is kind of the target that um, streaming services have agreed upon agreed upon for um, at most music mixes. Um, though binaural mixes might be just naturally a little louder because everything's coming through two channels. Um, the biggest challenge you'll probably encounter when mixing on headphones is um, monitoring loudness for lower frequencies below 100 Hertz, um, especially if you, if you decide to use an LFE channel. So if you see your loudness meter inexplicably peaking, but nothing sounds particularly loud, um, try attenuating frequencies in that low range and hopefully you'll see that loudness start to come down. Uh, so, so far, this is looking a lot like jumping into a stereo mix. Um, so, the last thing I'll say in terms of session organization, um, I mentioned that these stems were all sent to me as stereo files, um, which you'll probably encounter now because a lot of things are mixed in stereo still. So a lot of these stems ended up sounding fine um, when I sent them through to the renderer, so I just kept them as is. But there are a couple reasons that I would want to break up a stereo stem. Um, first of all, I think mono objects tend to sound better and more natural in Atmos because sounds are mono in real life. Um, so I do try to convert stereo stems to mono where I can, um, usually ones that are very highly correlated and basically just forming a phantom center. Um, so in my experience, like I think I have the kick as mono in this mix. I think kicks of vocals, snares um, tend to sound better mono if you can swing it. Um, so the second reason that I might opt to break up a stereo object is for panning reasons. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, um, the music panner only lets you mirror the movement of stereo objects. So if I want to pan the left and right of a stem asymmetrically, I need to break them up into separate mono objects to be able to do that. So let me see, I think this object here is a good example of this. So I'm gonna go ahead and play this real quick. So you can watch the panning in the panners. Yeah, so there's no way that I would have been, <laughs> been able to make that work if I just kept those together as, as a stereo object. All right, so once I have all my tracks organized, um, I typically break up my mixing into three stages, which are panning, frequency balance, and spatialization. So let's keep going with panning, uh, which we've kind of already been talking about. So that means that right away, you're thinking about basically all of the philosophical points that we talked about on the slide that I showed you before. Um, so how do we make use of all this space around me? Am I trying to create something based in realism or something more abstract? Uh, what channel-based rules can I break now that I'm not tied to a specific number of channels? 
Um, I'm personally probably very biased by now because I've spent so much time uh, mixing on headphones, but I actually think one benefit of monitoring binaurally um, at this stage is that you aren't inhibited by the visual aspect of speakers and might make some more adventurous decisions because of that. Um, but that being said, there are a few things that I'd recommend keeping in mind for panning on headphones. So as I click through these plugins, you'll notice that um, I put a lot of my elements on that wall of the virtual room. Um, this is because if I were to play this mix back on a speaker system, a sound placed off the wall um, would need to be played out of more speakers to place it in that position. Uh, so I'm, it might sound more spread out and less present, even though it might sound totally fine on headphones. Um, so I wouldn't say you should never place things off the wall, and I definitely do sometimes, but I would keep this in mind when you're deciding where to place super important and grounding elements like drums, bass, or lead vocals. Um, I would also encourage you to challenge ideas about what elements need to be placed toward the front or middle of the mix. So for example, um, I generally pan my bass across the front of the room, but this object um, is a bass synth and it's pan behind my ears. Um, this kind of helps spread out the low frequency energy in the mix and also helps counter all the movement I already have going on in front. Um, I would also just in general recommend making use of the areas 90 degrees to your left and right um, and even kind of right behind the ears of the listener like this object here. Um, let's take a listen to hear what this sounds like. Yeah, so that's kind of placed right behind the ears. And generally, I think that panning things to this area can really help add a sensation of width to the mix. Um, and then, of course, always remember that you have the height dimension to build up into as well. And speaking of elevation, um, if you have, if anyone has like a background in psychoacoustics, it's not a bad idea to think about that stuff when you're making panning decisions. Um, human hearing without visual aids, particularly when it comes to elevation, is actually not very precise. So don't get too frustrated trying to hear the difference between 45 and 50 degrees of elevation. Um, also, we tend to perceive higher frequency sounds as more elevated than lower frequency ones. So again, don't get too frustrated if you can't get your bass guitar or kick to sound like they're way above you. Um, you can also use this to your advantage when you're figuring out how to spread things out in the height dimension. Um, I tend to use more elevation with sounds like shimmery synths or strings like this object here um, because most people are likely to perceive them as elevated anyway. All right. And so the last thing I usually do before leaving the panning stage is to figure out all of my binaural settings. So as I mentioned earlier, binaural settings are part of that room response feature um, and they're unique to the Atmos headphone experience. Um, and they allow you to control the distance or the perce perceived distance of an object from the listener. So just like we wanna pan objects left, right, front, back to spread out frequency energy, um, adding distance variety can also help in this respect. Um, and for that, we use the binaural settings plugin that you see here on the screen. Um, this just has to be placed on any track in your session. Um, it doesn't matter where, just somewhere so that it can connect to the renderer. Um, so there are four possible settings. Sorry, one second. Um, yeah, so there are four possible settings near mid, far, and off. Um, and off means that you can choose to turn binaural processing on an object off completely if you want to. Um, the mid setting is kind of the default and it's supposed to sound like the approximate distance between the listener and a sound source if the listener were listening on loudspeakers. Um, but if you're mixing on headphones and you'd like to add some depth to your mix and not be locked into this particular distance, um, you can choose to set objects to near and bring them closer to you or to far and push them further back. So I'm going to play a couple examples here so you can hear the difference between those. So this is my snare in mid in the default setting. All right, and this is the far, that same snare in the far setting. So 
So hopefully you should be able to hear that it seems a little bit further away from me and you can hear that increased room response. Um, and then lastly, this is that snare set to near. So in contrast, much drier than those other two settings. And uh, the near setting really should sound like it's quite close to your head. Um, so if you want to avoid, for example, bringing an object off the wall, like I was talking about earlier, using this near setting can be a great way to achieve that effect on headphones without having to sacrifice anything for your loudspeaker playback. Um, so as you can see in this plugin, um, I usually try to distribute my objects pretty equally between near, mid, and far. Um, ultimately, I think these settings can be pretty dependent on the timbre of an object. Uh, but generally, I tend to put rhythmic sounds like drums um, and near or mid to give them a little bit more impact. Um, and then I find myself putting things that might already have some reverb on them, like guitar and synths um, and far a lot. Um, but again, these are not rules at all, and they can vary a lot from mix to mix. So. Whatever you decide at the panning stage, I think it's mostly important to keep in mind that just because you can make every object swirl around your head doesn't mean you should. Um, in fact, keeping a lot of objects in static positions can actually create a very stable and realistic spatial image. Um, a lot of times I make a rule for myself where I can only have like one thing moving at a time. Um, and that's just to kind of keep things under control and stay away from the mix becoming too gimmicky. Um, overall, the decisions that you make should really be done to serve the music and the arrangement. All right, so after panning, I usually move on to adjusting anything involving frequency balance. Um, so I try not to do any EQ until after I'm sure where I'm going to pan something, um, because if it ends up behind or above me or really anywhere that's not right front and center, um, there's going to be some coloration of its timbre due to, on headphones, the HRTFs. Um, so I wouldn't want to spend too much time shaping a sound only to find it sounds totally different once I pan it behind me. Um, one great thing about the Atmos mixing process is that you can use pretty much all of the same plugins that, would, that you would use at this stage in a stereo mix. Um, so I mostly use like FabFilter, Waves, Isotope, all stereo and mono plugins, and they work just fine. Um, because all of this processing happens before you even send the objects over to the renderer. So I didn't use too much EQ in this mix, actually, because um, it was mixed really well and they all sounded very balanced coming in. Um, so most of these instances of EQ are high passing to get rid of some unnecessary muddy frequencies. Um, I think I used some compression here on my snare um, to bring out some crispness and punch that it had kind of lost moving from stereo to Atmos. Um, otherwise, it looks like I have a couple instances of this Waves Imager um, and this Ozone um, Vintage Tape plugin. So um, the Imager I used because this stereo stem had like a very strong phantom center. And I found that using the imager kind of pushed the sound um, to the sides of the mix, um, leaving a lot more room for objects in the center. And then this uh, tape plugin, um, I use a lot when I break up stereo stems into mono objects. And then if you send each one through at slightly different settings, um, it helps again to de-emphasize that phantom center make the image sound wider, more diffuse, if that's what you need. Um, also, if you get stereo stems that are hyper compressed, um, they can sound a little lifeless in the Atmos environment. So I've found that harmonic tools like tape machine plugins or um, exciters can be really useful to kind of re-energizing those sounds. So yeah, not too much EQ in this mix, but that's pretty typical of something that's already been mixed in stereo beforehand. Um, and it gives me more time to talk about spatial effects, which I think are the way that you can do the most to elevate your Atmos mix. Scroll down here to the bottom. So this is the part of the Atmos mixing process where you'll probably wanna add some extra tools to your workflow that you wouldn't use in stereo. Um, and by that, I mean mostly immersive reverbs. So I mostly use Exponential Audio's Stratus 3D, um, which can go all the way up to 712. Um, some others I've used are Phoenix Verb, also from Exponential Audio. Um, and I think Waves also has a few surround reverb plugins. Um, 
immersive reverbs work really well in Atmos because first of all, they can feed right into that pre-configured bed. Um, but most of all, they're great for, for providing like subtle reflections that can really make you feel like you're in the same room as the music. Um, so I have four different reverbs going on in this mix, actually. Um, there are two 712 reverbs, which I have routed to my bed. This first one here um, is dark, but a relatively neutral chamber reverb. Um, I use this for most of the elements in the mix. Um, and then the second one has more character, um, sounds brighter, more metallic. Um, and I use this for some brass hits and some other synths in like more, inten more intense sections in the mix. Um, I chose these mostly to match the stereo reverbs that were used in the stereo mix. Um, but it's definitely typical of most of my Atmos mixes to have like one neutral reverb to add spatialization um, and then one or more aesthetically adventurous reverbs to add character and individuality. So here's an example of what this more distinctive reverb sounds like. Um, all right, so this is my brass hit first totally dry. or dry as and that's the stem that I received. Um, and then this is what it sounds like with my reverb. So you can hear that it capitalizes on the brassiness of the instrument and also adds some reflections behind the listener so that brass really fills the whole space. So after setting up these immersive reverbs, the only thing I felt was still a little lacking was the sense of height. Uh, so I also added two stereo reverbs, just using this FabFilter Pro R plugin. Um, I wanted these to sound very resonant, but also harsh and kind of arid, and really make the listener feel like there was a lot of space above them. Um, so rather than routing these to the bed, I actually sent them as objects, which just gives me more freedom when I'm panning them. So I ended up putting them both on the ceiling, one in the front here, and one in the back to kind of um, accentuate the height in the mix. So aside from reverb, you can also use delays to spatialize your mix. Um, so in this mix, I have a couple of stereo delays set up. And um, I, I usually send these over as objects, not through the bed. Um, this first one, I have just panned across the front of the room. It's basically just a stereo widener like you would find in a regular stereo mix, um, but it can also help to make objects at the front of the mix sound more externalized, more fully realized. I also have a second stereo delay that I've sent to the back of the room. And I use this mostly to send my bass to the back of the room, decorrelated, um, just another way to spread out that low frequency energy. And then last, I have several instances of this um, multi-tap delay called Slapper, which is a plugin that just really integrates well with the Atmos environment, I think. Um, and like my reverbs, I can route it right to that bed. Um, I'm also a very visual learner and I really like the way this interface is set up. So you can basically drag and drop all of the taps wherever and whenever you'd like them to be and just endlessly design your own delays. Um, so immersive delays like this are another great tool for creating subtle spatial cues um, that further that sense of objects being in the room with you, or they can help to create big musical moments that maybe aren't spatially possible in stereo. So the uh, last thing I'll play is a um, example of my more neutral reverb and one of these slapper delays. Uh, I think it's this one. So it's just a bunch of taps all around the room. So this is a good example of them kind of working together. Um, so I'll play first my strings track, uh, totally dry. It's pretty quiet, so we have to turn up your headphone volume. All right. Um, and then now I'll play the same track with reverb and delay. Yeah, so hopefully you're able to hear those reflections that Slapper is just sending all around the mix, um, which I think helped to emphasize the elevation of this object and also make that left-right trajectory um, sound a little smoother and more natural. 
Um, so that's just about it for this mix. So just to close out, um, I'll play the last minute or so of the mix. So you can take another listen now that you have a little bit more context. Just to close, I want to emphasize one more time um, just how much Atmos mixing techniques are not set in stone. Um, also, this whole demo was based around an electronic mix. So if this had been another genre, my whole approach could have been totally different. Um, so like I mentioned earlier, other engineers could be doing things completely differently. And I say that all to, to you know, just to emphasize that you should not be afraid to explore um, challenge or challenge any like widely accepted accepted stereo mixing norms and just to do whatever works best for your music. Um, so I'll just leave you with one more slide here. And this is a QR code that will lead again to that Dolby professional site where you can find tutorial videos, um, a link to download a 90 day free trial of the Dolby Atmos production suite, as well as the music panner and binaural settings plugins, and then also more info about Avid Play. All right. Uh, thank you guys so much for being here today.